This is Jean Calment. She was born in France in 1875. When she was one year old, the telephone was invented. When she was four years old, the light bulb was patented. When she was nine, the steam turbine was invented. At the age of 20, we had wireless communication for the first time. The Zeppelin and the Wright brothers with fixed wing air also both happened in her 20s. Uh, essentially, all modern medicine, except general anesthesia, happened in Jean's lifetime. So x-rays were discovered when she was in her 20s. When she was in her 50s, we discovered the antibiotic properties of penicillin. This is crazy. It means that up until she was 50 years old, you could have died from a cut. And once we had this discovery of penicillin, everything changes overnight. This uh, discovery changes uh, the quality of life for humans uh, for the rest of time. In terms of information technology, it wasn't until Jean's 60s that we had the first programmable computer. And then in her 70s, we invented the transistor that has allowed computers to become smaller and cheaper and faster in the years since. When she was 90, we came up with email. And at the time of Jean's 100th birthday, we came up with the internet. Jean died in 1997, 122 years young, making her the oldest, the oldest person to uh, ever have been uh, recorded to have lived. In her lifetime, she saw incredible innovation, and that innovation corresponds to uh, complete overhauls in the way that humans live and the quality of our life. So for example, 200 years ago, the vast majority of people on Earth were hungry every day. Today, only one in 10 people on the planet live in extreme poverty. Likewise, 200 years ago, almost everyone on the planet was illiterate. And now, almost everyone on the planet is literate. In terms of lifespan, when Jean Calment was born, the average life expectancy in Western Europe was 38 years, just 38 years. By the time she died, that more than doubled to 77. So technology changes rapidly in one person's lifespan, and that change leads to enormous um, changes in the way that humans live their lives. So today, we have about 100 million people born on Earth every year. Given that lifespans have continued to extend since Jean Calment's uh, death, we can reasonably anticipate that one of these 100 million people born today will live as long as Jean Calment did. And so that child will live into the 2140s or beyond. What change will this child bear witness to? And how will that change impact the life of humans? So there are uh, reasons, in my belief, that technological progress is accelerating. So the incredible change that Jean witnessed that I just went over, that is nothing compared to what will happen in the coming decades. So one of the key drivers behind this change is that there are more brains on the planet than ever before. And each of those brains has more time than it's ever had to think cognitively about things as opposed to, say, tilling the fields. So we have way more brains, way more thinking time per brain, and those brains are all connected well, most of them are connected in real time over the internet, such that if there's a new paper published, a new line of code is uh, created that is uploaded uh, into servers online and you can access them in real time. So lots of brains, thinking lots, and sharing that information with all the other thinking brains. So that in and of itself gives this huge tailwind to innovation, this accelerating pace of technological change. But there is another wild card outside of human intelligence that is going to make an even bigger difference in the coming decades, and that's artificial intelligence. So AI algorithms, they typically are trained on lots of data, and we have exponentially more sensors collecting data on the planet as years go by. So your wearable devices, your smartphone, self-driving cars, industrial sensors, all of these are propagating around the planet, 
and collecting more and more and more data. So lots of data for training our AI algorithms and storing those data is becoming exponentially cheaper as years go on. Not only is storing the data becoming cheaper, but computing with the data is becoming cheaper as well. So we have way more data all the time. About every 18 months, the amount of data on the planet doubles. And computing with all of those data is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, so we can build more and more powerful AI models. I'm an expert in a particular branch of AI called deep learning. And so to give you a little sense of how deep learning works, I have up on this slide um, a schematic of an artificial neural network, also known as a deep neural network or a deep learning system. And so it consists of a few dozen artificial neurons that are inspired by your biological neurons in your brain. So all of the white boxes here are these artificial brain cells. And on what we're trying to do in this diagram is we have taught an algorithm how to recognize the spiral shape. So it can detect whether there are orange dots or blue dots based on their location alone. And so the first layer on the far left, there's eight of the uh, white boxes on the far left. Those are artificial neurons. The first layer, they all detect straight lines at specific orientations, just like the first brain cells in your brain that receive information from your eyes. Those can pass information to a second layer that can combine those straight lines into curves and corners. Then we have a third layer that can make even more complex abstractions on those curves and corners until we get to the two uh, artificial neurons on the far right. And you can see that they have a detailed spiral shape that allows this deep learning system to have learned the spiral pattern. Now, learning that spiral pattern, it's relatively simple. So we only needed a couple of dozen artificial neurons to do it. But thanks to the abundance of sensors and data storage and compute power that we have and that's exponentially increasing as years go on, we can train much, much, much larger AI systems. So the biggest AI systems today don't have a couple dozen neurons like this. They have trillions of them. And instead of just having four layers, they have hundreds of layers. And so this allows an incredible amount of nuance and power in these AI systems. And it means that AI systems are overcoming human capability on more and more um, human capabilities every day. So just 10 years ago, for the first time, we had enough data and cheap enough, cheap enough compute to allow deep learning models to work in a broad range of applications, just 10 years ago. And now, they are ubiquitous. You interact with deep learning models dozens of times a day. When you look at your phone and it recognizes your face, a deep learning model is doing that. When you speak to your phone and it converts your audio into text, a deep learning system is doing that. When you do a web search and, you're, and you find instantly what you were looking for, that web search was guided by deep learning. So as we have way more data and much cheaper compute in the coming decades, how is that going to impact um, our human lives? Things are going to accelerate dramatically. So for climate change, for example, today, AI systems allow energy to be much more efficiently allocated in an electrical grid. So we waste less energy. In the future, AI systems will help us design uh, better climate technologies, like more efficient solar panels. And AI is even playing a leading role today in helping us achieve nuclear fusion. I earlier spoke about lots of brains on the planet. Those brains are going to want to eat. And we're, so we're going to need to feed billions more people in the decades to come, and AI is going to play a big role in that as well. So AI today already is helping with the automation of farming. So machine vision systems can help with, um, with agriculture and have fewer hands tilling the fields, so we're more efficient with the manual labor that we have in the fields. In the future, AI will play a key role in um, increasing uh, crop yields further, in uh, engineering um, plants so that they have more nutritional value, so that they are hardier to the climate change that is coming. Um, and so enormous uh, opportunity for AI in agriculture as well. And then finally for healthcare, 
Today, AI systems have already overtaken expert radiologists on being able to identify tumors in a lot of, uh, in a lot of radiological scans. AI systems today also are far better at predicting the molecular structure of biological compounds than humans could ever imagine they'd be able to do. In the decades that are coming, AI systems will also personalize medicine. They will help us predict pandemics. Uh, AI will help us to design pharmaceuticals. They'll take care of the elderly. So there is an enormous amount of application areas for AI in medicine and health. And so not only will lifespans continue to extend, but the quality of our lives into old age will improve as well. Now, not everything is rosy about AI. I don't want to give you that impression. So even today, AI-driven news feeds are polarizing politics all over the world. AI systems today, a major shortcoming of them is that they are largely trained on data created by humans. And humans have unhelpful stereotypes. So for example, AI systems today are more likely to think that it's acceptable for a male to be a firefighter and a nurse to be a female than the other way around. Um, so this is a problem that we are only beginning to tackle. There are also uh, racial prejudices in today's AI systems. So the surveillance systems that can recognize faces are better able to accurately recognize lighter skin faces than darker skin faces, which means that darker skin people are more likely to be erroneously identified by these surveillance systems and wrongfully arrested. So there are problems with AI today, but there are even bigger potential problems with AI in the future, existential problems for our race um, and for, for our entire species. And that is because um, people and creatures that are more intelligent than others on this planet tend to not be very kind to those that are less intelligent. So chimpanzees are only a tiny little bit intelligent less than humans, a tiny little bit less intelligent than humans, and yet we can imprison them, we can kill them, uh, and they have no ability to control us or impact our society. The AI systems that are coming in the, in, in the decades that are ahead of us could be far more powerful, far more intelligent than humans. So there's an event that could occur in our lifetimes as we collect enough data, as we build big enough AI systems, these could become more intelligent than us. We call that an event called the singularity. And at that point, these algorithms might not be a little bit more intelligent, like we are to a chimp, they might be so much more intelligent than us that we will be like an insect to them. And you don't think about, about it at all when you kill a fly, when you step on a bug. It might be the same for an AI system and humans. So big potential existential risk ahead. But my talk for you today is one of optimism. So while there are risks with AI today and in the future, we can do things, you can do things, to help mitigate um, the issues. So think back to that firefighter example. If a system is recommending people for jobs, it should not prefer people that are male for a firefighter role than are female. And although the historical data might suggest that males more often have that job, we know that that is not the um, correct thing that an algorithm should be outputting. And so we can put extra effort in to avoid these unwanted biases in our algorithms. So as a user of any AI algorithm today, you should be wary of results because of how those results are um, potentially um, influenced by human decisions of the past. And so if somebody's selling you an AI system, you should be sure to be um, pressing them to be giving you evidence that their system is not um, uh, propagating unwanted biases. So that's the first thing you can do. Another thing you can do is you can vote for or uh, lobby your local politicians to be funding retraining programs for people whose jobs are displaced by AI and automation. So while studies suggest that automation, including AI, creates more net jobs than it destroys, certain careers are definitely negatively impacted and displaced. 
And so we need to be funding programs to be retraining those people who are displaced so that they can take advantage of the new opportunities that automation and AI create. My third takeaway for you is to consider getting involved or supporting AI safety research. So some people think that in the coming decades, the most impactful career choice you could make is to be an AI safety expert. Um, and so the image here is designed to connotate the steps of intelligence. And so as we create AI systems that ascend these steps of intelligence and potentially eventually overtake our intellectual capabilities, we need to set up guardrails or handrails in the image that um, try to align AI with um, social causes with uh, with humans so that they don't just squish us like a bug. Uh, so back to Jean Kelment from the beginning of this talk. She witnessed unbelievable technological change in her lifetime. Try to imagine that from her perspective. As a young Jean Kelment, with all of these innovations that happened, could she have possibly imagined that we'd be splitting atoms, that we'd have mobile phones and laptop computers by the time that she died? It's, I, I doubt that. And so, uh, now, with these deep learning systems, which have only become possible since her death, that we've only, in the last decade, had enough data and cheap enough compute to be training uh, these deep learning AI systems that are now dramatically changing the world, back to my original question about how um, a child born today who lives as long as Jean Calment, how can that child predict what's going to happen? Well, I gave you a taste today across medicine, agriculture, and climate change, how at least in the coming decades, the things could change. But as our deep learning systems, as our AI systems become more and more advanced, I can't see beyond the next few decades, and I'm not sure what's going to happen. But if you take some of the steps that I suggested today, you can help us create an AI future, a technological future, a level of abundance and prosperity that um, we can't even imagine today. Um, and by the way, um, all of the illustrations above the timeline, those were created by a machine. So uh, a state-of-the-art AI algorithm. And um, it doesn't necessarily, so I gave it various text prompts, and they didn't always turn out incredible. So here's one. Uh, I said, cartoon of a robot building a futuristic home. And this is what it gave me. In a few years, this will be doing an incredible job of that kind of image. So stay tuned and look out for that radically abundant future.